So welcome back to the second episode of our Christmas Wonders. I'm sure you already heard the first case which was presented by Irene Lang, which dealt with a patient who had severe pulmonary hypertension and which benefited severely because she had uh, the right medical treatment. I will now show you a case which is also a Christmas wonder. It's the case that I would like to call One Valve, Two Hearts. This is the case of a 32-year-old patient who was pregnant in the 16th week and she presented with progressive dyspnea and um, was a woman who really wanted to be pregnant and uh, had the problem that she could not get pregnant, so she had an in vitro fertilization. So she had a desperate uh, wish to be a mother, but she had one problem, and that was that she had a prosthetic mitral valve replaced uh, seven years ago, a bileaflet valve. So how do you see the situation of a young patient who has a child wish receiving a mechanical valve. Well, th this isn't what happened here. You know, she had the valve seven years ago and then probably met the right guy. So mm -hmm. that may have changed the situation completely. If, mm -hmm. if, generally, young people get mechanical valves because of the half-life of valves. But I think in this case, this may have been unforeseen. Well, it certainly was. Um, you know, the, the patient, when I talked to her, was not really aware of the problem that she has when she gets pregnant and she has full anticoagulation therapy because she has a mechanical valve. So um, whatever the situation was, she ran into problems. And the problem that she had was that she now presented to the emergency ward with severe dyspnea and with atrial fibrillation. And this is the initial echo. As you can see, there is something wrong. And I want to direct your attention first to the right ventricle. You can see that the right ventricle is clearly enlarged, that there seems to be an abnormal motion of the interventricular septum. Left ventricle looks fairly okay. And then if you look at the parasternal long axis, you will appreciate, of course, the mechanical valve here. And here you have the abnormal septal motion and the rather large right ventricle. So uh, obviously when you see this, uh, you start to think about pulmonary hypertension. Uh, we have an abnormal septal motion, we have right ventricle dilatation, we have poor right ventricle function. But Tommy, this is a different type of pulmonary hypertension. Most likely it's, it's post-capillary with a high filling pressure. Uh, pulmonary hypertension drugs do not work in these conditions. So uh, that's a different story compared with my first case. So looking at the slide, I think, you know, Irene, you're completely right. We have these two types of pulmonary hypertension. Uh, in the very first case that Irene presented, we had a patient with a precapillary pulmonary hypertension. And now we have a completely different problem. We have a problem that is probably related to a postcapillary pulmonary hypertension. And um, if you look at the next image or you go back to the image and you look more closely, I think you maybe already appreciated what the problem was. Because if you look at the mechanical valve here, it certainly shows an awkward motion. Remember, this should be a bileaflet prosthetic valve, which means you should be seeing two leaflets, only one leaflet but you only see the motion of one leaflet. And uh, when you use colored Doppler, you see that there is a turbulent inflow into the left ventricle. And this is very indicative of a problem related to prosthetic valve obstruction. So when in pregnancy was that taken? This was in the 16th week. So now we have the situation of a patient who has a very high mean gradient of 32 millimeters mercury. I think, um, you know, when you see patients with mitral stenosis, very rarely would you see such high gradients. Uh, do you agree, Irene? Mm -hmm. I've, I've done mitral valvuloplasty once on a patient with a similar situation, but without a mechanical yeah. valve, of course. Yeah. This was native mitral valve stenosis. I mean, you have to consider that uh, these high gradients are probably also related to the fact that she's pregnant. You have increased volume. So the gradients are probably higher than they are in a normal mitral stenosis patient. But uh, just from these three images, the diagnosis is quite clear. She has prosthetic valve obstruction and transesophageal echo uh, confirmed the diagnosis. If you look at this image, you see the problem right here. There's a thrombus positioned right here on this one leaflet. The other one is moving okay. And if you use colored up, you see that flow is only entering via one orifice and the other one is completely occluded by a thrombus, by a stuck uh, bileaflet prosthetic valve. And we are now confronted with the question of her anticoagulation. Obviously, uh, 
we have to question whether or not she was adequately anticoagulated. And this is the regimen she was on. She was 58 kilos, and she was switched to an oxyprin in the, um, in the 12th week, and she received 60 milligrams of uh, this dose once daily. And uh, my question to you, is this good? Mm. Well, she should have been on 2 times 60. That would have been the minimum. And, and given the, uh, you know, the history of in vitro fertilization is, is still, uh, exactly. at this time of the pregnancy, it's still irrelevant. Um, yeah. I think this is exactly the issue you see here. Uh, if you look at these four regimens, this is what you got, and this here is what you should have got. At least 60 milligrams twice daily, and the recommendation is also to check the anti-10A, because uh, there are very high fluctuations in the anti-10A during pregnancy, uh, in, in, in normal patients even, uh, the, the coagulation varies very strongly. And uh, it's very difficult to predict, even from the dose, what the right dose is. And in such patients, if you want to manage them and they need some form of anticoagulation, you have to check on the 10A uh, at a very strict protocol. You know, you take draw the blood four hours after injection and, and, and check these values. So this was not done, and she simply had a dose which was not adequate. Now, coming to the topic of anticoagulation during pregnancy, um, you know, there's different regimens. I don't want to go into the details of it, but basically you have a number of problems. One problem is that if you have them on warfarin, especially in the first trimester, they have a risk of developing uh, a phytopathy of the child. Um, Which is really, really a, a, a big problem. I've, I've seen a patient with embryopathy, uh, uh, the child had a diaphragmatic hernia, had a VSD. It was very sad, very yeah. dramatic. So it's especially uh, risky in the first uh, trimenon. Um, then again, uh, if you use heparin, uh, unfractionate or fractionate uh, heparin, you have a, probably a bit of a higher risk of fetal hemorrhage, and you also have a greater risk of prosthetic valve thrombosis because warfarin is still the therapy of choice in patients with um, mechanical valves. So most of the regimens uh, in pregnancy go towards switching the patients to uh, heparin as soon as possible and then leaving them on heparin um, and then towards the end of the pregnancy maybe switching them back to warfarin and then towards delivery then back to heparin because uh, heparin is safer uh, during uh, delivery. So this is the, the regimen, but uh, it can be discussed at uh, different... Switching uh, isn't the best thing to do either, right? It's, it's a big problem as well. You know, you can also leave the patients with uh, heparin throughout the whole pregnancy. This is, must be discussed in an individual case. But uh, the, the issue here is that um, we obviously are in a situation now that the patient already has this thrombotic valve obstruction. And um, what do we do now? Hold your breath. <laughs> Uh, treat her conservatively, increase the Lovenox or the enoxaparin, and think about thrombolysis. Thrombolysis okay. wouldn't harm the, the child. Uh, let, let's go through the different uh, possibilities. The first would be the increase of the dose of enoxaparin. Um, I think immediately when we saw this, we increased the dose anyway. Uh, the question is, how long should we wait until we see an effect? Will there be an effect? We've got the risk of, of course, hemodynamic compromise. We've got the risk of thrombosis. Don't forget that she could embolize and she could uh, you know, have a stroke. So this would be option one. The option two would be, okay, we put her to IV uh, UFH. In other words, we give her unfractioned heparin and we can steer maybe the dose a bit better. This is an option uh, which might help us to a certain extent, but we'll have the same problem as in option number one. Then we have the option that Irene discussed, which is thrombolysis. This would be something we could do. However, again, we would have the risk of dislodging the thrombus, causing stroke, and something that you know, we would anticipate only in patients who are severely unstable and who are actually not primary surgical candidates in normal patients. And then there's also this unclear risk for the fetus if we perform a thrombolysis. No, it's, it's very clear. It doesn't cross, TPA does not cross the okay. placental barrier. So this would not be an issue this for the fetus. This would not be an issue. Um, and then, of course, abortion and valve replacement. Um, this is something we discussed with the patient, but mm -hmm. remember, this patient wanted to have the child. And uh, this was something we didn't really consider after we talked to the patient. So 
we had another last option, and that would be the option of replacing the valve during pregnancy. Irene, what is your take on this option? I think I take number five. <laughs> okay. Well, this is exactly what we did, especially after we checked on the patient again uh, a few days later, and we see, saw no change with respect to the mobility of the leaflet. And uh, you can see right here that there is still obstruction. And uh, Tommy, can you distinguish thrombus from panus? Because that is not so clear to me, you know, and that's well, a very key issue. Yeah, I think we cannot distinguish thrombus from, um, uh, from panus in an echo, alone from the echocardiogram. However, we can if we look at the course of the patient. Mm -hmm. If we have um, uh, the problem developing slowly, uh, then it's probably more um, a panus. If it develops quickly, it speaks more in favor of um, a thrombotic obstruction. Um, in my belief, I think uh, these issues are sometimes um, combined because if patients are not anticoagulated adequately, uh, they kind of develop little thrombi which fibrose and thrombi or position thrombi which slowly grow into a panel. So I think there's an overlap between these two problems. C can you give us the details on how long she, ha she was on 60 milligrams of enoxaparin? Well, Probably yes. during in vitro fertilization they already switched. Uh, well, to. no, actually they only they started at the time of pregnancy. Uh, so it was started relatively late, which uh, leads me to believe that uh, the whole management was not really considered. I think when you have a pregnant patient who has a childbearing wish, you have to involve the cardiologist and mm -hmm. you have to involve also uh, people who are experts with respect to uh, blood coagulation. How many times did she try in vitro? Because uh, you know that because there is a lot of that's a, that's not so irrelevant because if you go through several rounds, you have much more. Um, uh, much longer period of the um, exogenous hormones. Mm -hmm. Might be a, 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 an issue as well. You know, uh, uh, mm -hmm. Whatever it is, I think that we have to understand that patients who are pregnant mm -hmm. have a different coagulatory system and that things change very dramatically. And if you, you have to know this before you plan, plan pregnancy. So what we did was we performed, well not we, but the surgeons, mitral valve replacement with tricuspid valve repair and um, Actually, everything went well. She uh, had no problems at all, and um, uh, she did have a placental premature uh, separation, and uh, this led her to have a cesarean section at the 31st week, but the child was doing fine, and she was doing fine, and all had a very, very happy ending. And I saw the patient uh, recently, and uh, she came with her child to visit us, and she's really doing fine and very happy. Um, of course, she now has a new valve, and. Um, but mechanical? She has a mechanical valve, yes. So this is the echo hmm. after surgery. Okay, so everything really went fine with her. Okay. And the gradients, of course, were low, so and the baby was doing fine. So what was the, uh, what, uh, do you know the anatomy of the valve? Was, was one of the leaflets stuck because of its thrombus? Yes, it was, or? It was a thrombotic, classic thrombotic, thrombotic obstruction, mm. yeah. It was a classic thrombotic obstruction. Would it have um, responded to thrombolysis, you think? Um, well, I think... Um, was it red? Um, to be honest, I don't know what the color of it was, but I can only say that I, even if it responds, I would not take the risk. Because if you look at the recent guidelines, it's only indicated if you have patients in shock yeah, yeah. who are not surgical candidates. And you know what we were hesitant, and the key message that for me the learning experience was that, uh, yes, we can even perform cardiovascular surgery on pregnant patients. Um, there are certain risks involved. We have to know these risks. For example, hyperthermia is a problem. If you lower the temperature too far, it's a risk to the fetus. Uh, and of course, um, you know, you are still confronted with anticoagulation during the whole procedure, but it can be done. Um, you have to time the procedure uh, adequately, of course, but uh, as you can see, um, it is possible. So I think uh, this is a wonderful case that shows that sometimes we can really perform miracles of course, the patient shouldn't have gotten the situation in the first place, but it worked out fine. Super. Okay. Well, I hope you enjoyed this case, and I hope you'll also be with us when I show you the next case, which is also going to deal with the pregnant patient.